I first met Les Dawson at a charity show. In fact, I always seem to be meeting Les Dawson at charity shows. He was a lovely, warm, generous man. And when you met, he didn't just shake hands, he gave you a big hug. To my mind, he was the greatest droll comedian we ever had. He played the clown prince of misery, lord of the lugubrious, and was always ready with a morose quip. He was a man of the people, a comic of the people. He was a bloke. Les's humour was the eternal subjects of comedy. Marriage, children, wives, and the dreaded mother-in-law. I believe on the odd occasion I have mentioned my mother-in-law to you. There's a woman for you, I think. <laughs> that Gorgon came to live with us three months ago. As soon as I heard the knock on the door, I knew it was her, because the mice were throwing themselves on the traps. <laughs> Some rotten news, the wife, my dear wife's mother, had a terrible accident at work. Apparently, a hot rivet dropped in her drawers and she fell off the oil rig. <laughs> my mother-in-law went for a stroll the other night. She came back from the karate clinic lesson. She passed a dark alley and a sex maniac jumped out and ignored her. <laughs> I wasn't surprised because the last time I saw a face like hers, the owner of it was being milked. <laughs> Funny thing how you first meet the woman that you marry. I, I first met the wife in a tunnel of love. She was digging it. <laughs> I took the wife to Whipsnade Zoo. We haven't got room for it. <laughs> and every time I go there, I have to pay, I have to pay for two tickets. One to get her in and one to get her out. <laughs> When the wife and I first got married, we lived with the wife's mother. We were there for over five years. And I must say that in all that time, we only fought three times. Morning, noon and night. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what do you do when you're trapped into marriage? I married the wife for life. The only trouble is she hasn't shown any yet. <laughs> Just then the wife came in. She lurched in from the kitchen. She, she'd obviously been getting the breakfast ready, but she, she was still carrying the fire extinguisher. <laughs> <laughs> On top of all this, I had a terrifying experience the other night. I was just pushing the car back in the garage. Had a flying saucer landed on the front garden. Had a thing like a six-foot sponge pudding got out. <laughs> pair of legs, seven arms, and eyes like chapel pegs. I wasn't frightened because I'd just been to the wife's mother. <laughs> Les loved ladies and exploited the natural fear that men have of their feminine wiles. If he was tough on anyone, it was on himself turning his pudding features and bargain basement physique into a rich vein of humour. Many years ago, my grandfather used to dangle me on his knee and tell all his friends that one day I'd be a rich, famous comedian. My grandmother, with tears of pride in her eyes, would tell all the neighbours that I'd grow into a handsome man that women would adore. It's a pity they're not here tonight, but unfortunately both since died of acute embarrassment. <laughs> Before I was born, my father used to have a nasty habit of running off and leaving mother for months on end. And then when I came on the scene, they gazed at me in my crib and they held hands and ran off together. <laughs> I said, thanks for having me on the show. I said, I'm very grateful. I said, because these days there's not a lot of work for comedians. He said, there you go, let's worry about other people again. <laughs> His comic venom found its natural home in Blankety Blank. Les turned this gaudy BBC bauble into a national treasure by treating everything and everyone on it, especially himself, with the same loving contempt. See, this is the first time I've hosted a quiz show. And quite frankly, I feel about as comfortable as a lame turkey sat on a pile of Paxo <laughs> listening to Christmas carols. <laughs> Some people have a face that looks as though it's lived in. <laughs> Our next celebrity, his face looks as though it's full of squatters. <laughs> but I keep his photograph on the mantelpiece. It keeps the kids away from the fire. <laughs> Here's a young lady who's a great singer. She's made a killing in show business. I'm not surprised her voice is murder. No. <laughs> so it's nice to have this gentleman on the show. He looks a little bit like a golden green Barry Manilow. <laughs> I'm not 
I said is at the bottom of show business, but he gargles with suppositories. <laughs> Your friend said you have a big mouth. <laughs> you haven't got a big mouth, it's just you can eat bananas, haven't we? <laughs> you have two ambitions to enter the Miss UK contest and to own your own fashion boutique. Tell us something about that. Which one? I think that'll do. <laughs> that <will> do. <laughs> You're the head of economics at Widening Comprehensive School and your husband is head of politics. Yeah. God, I bet you have some boring nights in your life. <laughs> Take your time. Very nice tonight. That's a lovely dress. CNAs are fabulous. <laughs> well, you're not going up to because the BBC and their largesse <coughs> refuse absolutely to have people walk away from this friendly little show of ours with nothing. Okay. But tonight we're going to make an exception. <laughs> <laughs> As this is the first show <laughs> in a whole new series of Blankety Black, we have a pound that for the first time matches the prizes. <laughs> Decrepit. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the prizes? Would you want to win them? <laughs> I'm not doing this show for money. I do Blankety Black because I want to do it. And if I were to tell a lie, may the gods above Olympia, may they strike me dumb, but never speak again, and nobody would. <laughs> Get me off this show! <laughs> Les never forgot his comic roots. And when he donned a frock to become a Lancashire buttlax or a corset-busting pantomime dame, he was keeping alive a long tradition of northern humour. We, on the last series, we introduced these two old women in a laundrette. But it is something peculiar to Lancashire, the fact that when two women talk, particularly that age group, if there's anything at all which they consider risque or something compatible to the, the female body, they never finish the sentence. Hmm. It's perfectly true, so you'll get anything. So, George, how are how's things? I believe she's near a time. Oh, yeah. I believe she's had a... They never finished the sentence. <laughs> That's right, in love. You look a bit upset. <laughs> I drop a lie down in a flush. You know. <laughs> what did you What did you go to the doctors for? Well, I'm not one for complaining as well, you know. Oh, I know. I've suffered for you. <laughs> Mind you, I blame his wife for the conditions in it. You know, I mean, after all, a man's entitled to a little bit of. <laughs> Oh, he's not had his leg over for years. <laughs> and they did a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen feet like her. <laughs> I know for a fact she'd been minging on Wilbur's lampshades in a Harrods bag. No. Oh, God, I know that one. <laughs> and she's not averse to knocking on your door and asking for half a pound to send a pulse. She's not very regular. <laughs> I didn't like the goat at first, but it's a nice little thing, isn't it? Uh, mm. The only trouble is it doesn't seem capable of doing it. <laughs> well, it's not actually native. No, it's not done it. No. It's not to perform. No. no. Anyway, the vet gave Bert some tablets to arouse the goat's virility. Oh. <laughs> what are they like? I don't know, but Bert said this taste of peppermint. <laughs> Les loved words. With his gravel voice, he delighted in using extravagant and ornate language. I just happened to glance at the night sky, and I marveled at the millions of stars glistening like pieces of quicksilver thrown carelessly onto black velvet. In awe, I watched the waxen moon ride across the zenith of the heavens like an amber chariot towards the ebon void of infinite space wherein the tethered bulks <laughs> of Jupiter and Mars hang forever festooned in their orbital majesty. And as I looked at all this, I thought, I must put a roof on this lavatory. <laughs> I, I would like to see introduced into school a love of ecology, because I happen to be the vice chairman of the Mordecai Appeal Fund for the preservation of the black infested swallowback duck of Bridlington, <laughs> which is in danger of extinction because of man's relentless search for natural resources. You don't have to be an ornithologist to understand the the cravings of this tiny feathered friend, which likes to mate on the very edge of the cliffs <laughs> at Scarborough so that the currents of air can spiral upwards and in the modern parlance, switch her on. <laughs> the male hangs from a diseased elm <laughs> until he hears this very distinctive mating cry. 
well, naturally, he does make mistakes, but when he hears <laughs> the full, the real mating cry, he leaps down from his twig and picks up his feathers in a tight bunch and in a series of swoops and skips, attempts to grow the female in the simple act of procreation, but because of oil slicks on the skin, <laughs> he tends to skid over the top of her. <laughs> And when they've done this three or four times, they do tend to say, sod it, let's have a drink with the lads. <laughs> Les was a genius, able to turn out finely tuned characters as easily as comic routines. He could have played Shakespeare, but settled for more down-to-earth acting roles in the dramatic comedies of playwrights like Alan Plater and Galton and Simpson. What do you do for a living? I, sir, I remember of the theatrical profession. I knew it. Oh. I knew it. As soon as I saw you trolling down the gangway, oh. I, I said to myself, I said, Peregrine, I said. <laughs> now there's an old pro if ever I saw one. I am a comedian. Really? Are you on that programme, you know, with all those others? I'm not, no. My jokes are, but I'm not. <laughs> What's your name? Dawson. Les Dawson. I've never heard on you. <laughs> Are you married? She went to Garlisle to try and buy a piano. There's a coincidence. What I'm saying is, I've got entanglements. We all have. I turn across a ploughed field. I keep getting your trousers caught on barbed wire fences. All the time it's getting darker. I've noticed that. I keep hoping for a great shaft of light to show me the way I'm going. Like that fella. I don't think I know him. St. Paul it was. Oh, yes. On the road to Damascus, he saw this bright and shining light in the sky. It made a big impression on him. He wrote a lot of letters about it. I thought I saw it once on the road to Oldham. It turned out to be the sun's reflection in somebody's cucumber frame. Perhaps the true measure of Les is that he was a romantic masquerading as a clown. He was an excellent writer and an accomplished musician. He traded melancholy for laughs. Sorry about that. to a positive avalanche of requests. I intend to play the piano forty for you this evening proper. The piece I've elected to play for, I hope your gratification, is Emmanuel de Fire's Ritual Fire Dance. Thank you.
1984, Les was interviewed by Roy Plumley for the BBC series Favourite Things. In it, he spoke about his childhood, his family, and his love of literature. It speaks more than any personal tribute could. So let's leave the last laugh to Les. I told you before, I'm not Les Dawson. He ran off when Hildegard was born. You've been to a new hairdresser. Wait a minute. It really is. Oh, Rocket Plumbing. I told you it was. Don't you feel the fool now? How do you do? Why do you come in? <laughs> the first one today. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> well, well, well. Come in. <laughs> Roy Plumley. Eh? The thinky man's Russell Harty. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Make yourself comfortable. Right, thank you. Good Lord, I do. I remember you when you were a stuntman on Songs of Praise. Good Lord. I think I'd make a good castaway, you know, come to think of it. There's one tune that the wife always whistles when she's on the wall of death. What was it? Rafal's Pavan for Infant Defunct. Les, this isn't Desert Island Disc. You've done that already. This is Favourite Things. Oh, oh that is. BBC. Let's get on with it. Stop clowning about. Funny you should say that. Clowns, one of my favourite things. That's one facet of show business I'd like to be. I'd like to be involved as a clown. I've got a collection of clowns. <laughs> and there also there's um, two paintings that were done of me by a Birmingham artist. One that I posed for. And the other one, which was in his own imagination. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there's something about clowns. I mean, there's a small boy, like most small boys, and the clown was the first thing you identified with for humour. And of course, it was visual. And there's something about a fright wig and baggy trousers and a red nose, and that was on my wedding day. <laughs> there's just something about clowns that um, really turns me on to use the modern phraseology. It really does. Now, this clown sitting beside you, he's a, a rather particular friend of yours, isn't he? He's my agent. <laughs> What's his name? Sad Sam. Named after the wife's mother, really. I know, there's a lot of superstitious hogwash in this business, but I do feel well, I've got him around. I always feel slightly, you know, more at ease. I remember being at the circus once, and the thrill I was full of toffee and ice cream, you know, that was on last Tuesday. But as soon as the clowns came on, to me, that was magic. I don't know why, it's... A, they're funny people. And uh, number two, there's something, I don't know, timeless, for the want of a better phrase, for the timeless quality of our clowns. I think the whole canopy of life is in the face, in the action, in the movement. Ever since I was a child, clowns have been very predominant with me. Where did you spend your childhood, Les? Where do you come from? Originally, Manchester. Hmm. Yes, it was a hard childhood, in many ways. Mainly because, although it's difficult for you, I know, looking at this somewhat magnificent profile, but oddly enough, I was an incredibly ugly baby. In fact, I was so ugly, I had to give the midwife gas in there before she delivered me. <laughs> I know mother used to look at me often in the cot, and she'd say to my father, I don't know what to make of him, and my father used to say, have you thought of a rug? <laughs> well, basically, we were a poor but poverty-stricken family. Yeah. What was your ambition? What did you want to be? I wanted to eat. You were a boxer? Yes, I was the only boxer ever carried in the ring as well as out. I wasn't very good, actually. My father thought I had admit to do it. I became known as washing line because I was hanging over the ropes. So I gave it up very quickly. I wasn't, I wasn't cut out for violence, you know. I fall mean, asleep running for a bus. But you had to go into the army. Yes, in fact, uh, where, when I was brought up, you can still see my heel marks in the concrete where they dragged me. I was a conscript. 
I was in the tank crew. Yeah. Tank driver. Were you driving? Well, yeah, driver operator gonna you know, Queen yeah. Bay, second gun guards. And that's really where it started with the, the entertainment side of it. Yes, that's what I was thinking. You tell me that story once. What yeah. happened? It was Cambria Day, which is the day that tanks were used in the First World War. Mm -hmm. And it's always a celebration, you know, with all the various armoured corps. And they had nobody to play the piano. I used to just tittle a little bit on it. Because I stood it under Dame Myra Hess, the piano, but she got too heavy. So I went in the mess to just do a play for them, and I never went back. You had an ambition to write. Yeah. What did you want to write? Uh, essays. Why essays, Les? I don't know. I like words. I think the only one I was ever proud of. I went to Paris initially to write them, but I, was, I, used, to, I used to want to write things in the vein like Elia Lama, something like this, you know, lovely prose mm -hmm. sort of thing. Hoarfrost hanging delicately from sudden leaves or something like this, you know. Tell me about Paris. You wanted to have a sort of left bank existence. Well, I thought Paris was the place to gravitate to. I mean, it's not really. If you're going to write a novel, you should do it in Bradford. Because there's too many distractions in Paris, you know. How long were you there? About 18 months, actually. Why did you come back? Why did you leave Paris? I was broke. Yeah. To me, it's like a spoilt woman, Paris, you know. I love, I love Paris. It's very nice. Mm -hmm. It's wasted on the French, totally. You know. So you'd done some piano playing in the army and in Paris. When, when did comicking come into it? Well, I used to play the piano and sing and tell a few gags, especially when I sang and played the piano. But acting in those days was dreadful. I mean, it really was bad. Would you like to see a little gobbit, would you? I'd love to, yes. What did you do? Well, this, this is... You sat yourself at the piano. Well, I found it more comfortable that way. <laughs> and this was the sort of thing I used to do. Hi. This terrible grenade. I was filling, shall I? So I've got quite a few fillings, you know. In fact, my gums have got metal fatigue. Oh, yes. And I go, hi there. Yeah, I just love being here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to play a little song, and I hope you like it. Hey, you be my mom in the red room. Be my baby in the red room. I'll be a baby coming home tonight. I used to get paid off. Yes, I... Quite regular. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I used to get paid And then, after, I was living in London for quite some time. I was living in a cubicle with a plug point, passing the flat. And um, I went down to all the clubs and so forth, and all the agents. Not the usual thing, you know, we'll let you know. We'll ring you, which was hard to do, because I got a phone. That didn't dole me for months after. And I went to see an agent, Al Heath, his name was. He still is in existence. And he gave me a, a week's booking in, in, for 16 quid in Hull. Yes. Have you doing, been to Hull? Doing that same act? Yes. Yes. Totally. To all these hardened fisher folk, men with salt creased in the lines of the faces, hard men. And on I went. I just want to say a great place to be in Hull. I've been here before, but it was shut. Which got roars of silence. Of course. You know, I was getting crouching innovations. And on the Wednesday, I couldn't take with me. It began to dawn on me that by this time, failure was a stark reality. Really failing. I mean, I was lucky. I mean, I, 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 my only ambition in those, those days was for luxuries in life, like bread and shoes. You know, things, it was getting worse. And on the Thursday, I did the time-honored mistake. Although in this case, it works of going for a few drinks, and I drank more than I should have done. Yeah. This that was your chef? Yes, that night on the piano, the great pleasure to be in this kipper depot, and found that I was playing off key. You know, terrible things like that. I started telling about my life and how bad things were, and for the first time in my chequered career, somebody clapped in the corner, a little bald-headed man clapped in the corner. I said, thank you for clapping. He said, I'm not clapping, I'm slapping, I had to keep awake. But then I started to get a few laughs, laughs, and that's how it started. Yeah. So I, I all hold quite a lot, actually. You've been all round the country many times, every city and town in the British Isles. Mm. Which is your favourite? Which is your favourite town? I must be fair, Blackpool. This has been laid on special for you, Plumley. Oh, business is terrible. Where's everybody? To me, where's everybody? Would you lie on top of a tram oh, in the wind? Oh, this bracing air? It's very good for that you. Lovely, rich sea air. It's a mixture of ozone and hamburger fat. And this tram is for us. This just... tram has been specially commissioned for you. There's something for everybody. There's gambling for the people to gamble. It's restaurants and nightclubs and discos. 
And there's something for everybody. Yeah. Do you like the beach life? Do you swim a lot? Yes, I do. But that sea's very cold, you know. The fish wear mittens. Mm -hmm. That's the only problem with Blackpool, you see. Before you can eat a well, you have to rub its chest with Vic. And of course, one of the great highlights is the bathing beauty competition. Yes. Have you ever been to one? I never have. No, it's one of my ambitions. Mr. Plumley, Roy, if I'm ever so bold, you're going to not only see one, you're going to judge one. Ladies and gentlemen, the Roy Plumley. This is the first time that Roy has ever judged a beauty contest, so I think he's in for a real treat, don't you? Ladies and gentlemen, that great comedian, Les Dawson. <laughs> In judging, what is one look for? Oh, relapse. I have to take it for a course of treatment. Well, what you look for basically is charm and poise. And, uh, well, well, what is it? There are those who disapprove of beauty contest. Yes, I've often wondered why. I don't find it demeaning in any shape or form. No, no, excuse won't. the play on words. I find that the undraping of the nubile female body is to extol the virtues of femininity in itself. Plus, the fact is, may the world have got more. And the winner of the first prize goes to competitor number one, who is. Julie Turnbull from Blackpool. Lotham St. Anne's very close to the bustle of Blackpool, but very calm and peaceful and relaxed. Yes, it is. It's worlds apart, really. I think you need to get away from it all, you know. Yes, of course. And that's why we chose Lotham. We're very fond of it here, you know. And, of course, I think your family life is very important. How many of the children are still at home, Liz? Well, I have three children, one of each. Um, <laughs> two are still at home now. The eldest girl, Julie, she's a nurse in Nottingham. You've acquired some very lovely things. You, you like junk shops and, and going around. Yes, 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 I do. Yes, I met the wife. No, we... Uh, I think if you've got nice things around, you feel it's nice to relax amongst your things. Mm -hmm. Not exactly like... Uh, living up to your blue china, as Oscar Wilde would say. If you're not careful, possessions can take you over, you know. But I think to live amongst nice things is part of relaxation. Isn't it? Yeah. It's just one of my favourite things, too, to have a nice home. I mean, it's a lovely family house, this. It's surrounded by debt, but we're, we're very fond of it, you know. What's this new construction that's going on down there? I, I thought the bypass was coming through. That's a fish pond. The size of it now, I think we've probably got a, a sea manatee in it, a sperm whale. <laughs> So I think I've gone slightly over the top, because it's got a bridge going across it, and Alec Guinness is opening it shortly. <laughs> but uh, I, I think if you're going to do something, you might as well go over the top anyway. You know, I mean, when we first got married, we, uh, you know, we used to aspire to something like this. We didn't have the money in those days. We lived in a house that was so small, you know, when you turned the lights out, I was in bed before it was dark. So it's nice to have something around you that you can move freely in and feel at home in. You're handy for the golf club here. You like to get down there for a round or two. Oh, yes. Well, it's one of my favourite pastimes in golf, I must say, because I've just got that burning desire to go on there once and actually hit the ball. Lovely course here, the Fairhaven Golf Club. What do you mean? So it's sand. I mean the surrounding countryside. Do you mean there's more of it? <laughs> Vicious bitch! <laughs> You're a pillar of the golf club, Les, but uh, there's another club that you belong to. In fact, I believe I should refer to you as... Uh, uh, I should address you as Mr. President. Yeah, that's quite correct. Yes, I'm president of a club called the uh, 
the district club. Yes. And it's another of my favourite things, Roy, because it's a place I can escape to. It's a men-only club. It's the last bastion of male supremacy. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Well, you would put these properly. Sorry. <laughs> sooner or later. And thank you again. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, well, this is this is the Domino School. I I get this hallowed sanctum. Mm -hmm. This, of course, is the president's chair. Yes, Mr. President. I'm very proud to squat my little hands upon it. I'm sure you are. And this is where I relax. It's one of my favourite ways to relax. I also pay the rates. Well, it used to be. Yeah. Pay the rates. Yeah. yeah. Have you gone? I've gone, yes. Have you? I must, must point out there's one salient rule in this club, and that is visitors seldom win. We've <laughs> uh, got up there. Shoes? Sit and right. shoes. What the old man <laughs> 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 totally out of order. You may have noticed behind the bar there is a woman. It's the steward's wife. Now, it's one of the unfortunate artifacts that she has to be here. She doesn't normally come down. She's let out for an airing now and again. There have been times in its checkered career when we've had disasters on the scale of Krakatoa erupting. One of them was some years ago. Even now, I... One, the mind boggles at the inference of this. But a woman actually got through the double doors. That night was fairly full, I remember it well, through the mist of nostalgia. Snooker table was in full flight. Domino school was very active. So was the card school. And in walked, well she didn't walk, she drifted in like a bank of fog. A woman. <coughs> Can you imagine? Imagine how we felt. And the whole room became as like a forgotten tomb. A pregnant atmosphere. And we poised mid-air with cues, dominoes, cards. And it was one of those momentous things that must have happened when Hindenburg died, the same sort of thing. A grey cloud scudded across the top of the club. And one stalwart of the club, old Joe Two, was 79, tottered forward, glared at him with a sense of awe, and uttered the immortal words which are imprinted on every member's heart. He said, Good God, a woman. And she fled. She had the good sense, but we've never forgotten. Uh, I paid you. You okay. <laughs> 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 Right. Oh, damn, is it well, well, still well. go. Yeah, still going. Now, we've seen, Les, that you're a pretty gregarious man. What about your solitary pursuits? What was that word you did before? Your, your, um, well, I mean, you read a lot, don't you? No, you said something before that. That was totally Your fascinating. Your solitary pursuit. No, before that, garrulous, was it? Gregarious. It's only in the hot weather. You no, you like chaps. Oh, you yes. Like people. Well, not, you like moving not around. And, and... Oh, I like moving. Yes, yes. chatty circles. Mm. Mm. Totally, totally. Yes. Now, what, what do you like to do on your own? You read a lot. There's a lot of things I like to do, but not on my own. <laughs> yes, I do. I, I read a lot. I'm very, that's one of my favourite pursuits, reading, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. Favourite author is Neville Shute. Is it? Why, yeah. particularly? It's a simple storyteller who can make, who can weave a tremendous novel out of the, a very basic plot. He's very good. I think he's a prolific writer. Yes. How many books have you written? Though? Seven. Mm -hmm. Now, there's one you've written, a, a, a very serious book. I mean, most of your books are fairly light-hearted, but there's one mm. serious one. It's called The Time Before Genesis. It's not a gloomy book, really, but it's, just, it's in the form of a novel, you know. Yes. It's interesting to speculate. Are you a disciplined writer? Do you write regular hours in a regular place? No, not disciplined. I've got a place where I escape from the family because you've got to get away from everybody. Mm -hmm. You see what the dog's like over here. That's... So I usually go in the study at the back there and just pound away when I feel I've got something to say. I don't yeah. know how these people can devote eight hours to it because I certainly can't. Mm -hmm. Not on a fairly busy schedule because it's not just writing. I'm, you know, which I find great. It is, it is a favourite pastime, of course. But I mean, like most people, I wear two hats, and one is a more serious one. And that is the um, ceaseless task to try and make people aware of what's happened to us in the ecology field. Conservationism. Yes. What in particular? Well, I'm on the Mordecai Appeal Fund in Bloomington, which is for the preservation of the Morecambe Welk. 
But what is happening is because of man's relentless search for natural resources in Morkham Bay, there's a silt beginning to form into the lower strata of the water, which precludes the whelk from seeking a mate. Oh, no. You see, they have the fluted nostrils, whelks, and they seek out the opposite sex by virtue by eyesight. And what's been happening over the years with this silt rising, of course, they, they develop advanced myopia and uh, irritant stigmatism. And, of course, when they blindly fumble for a, a mate, they made some pretty bad mistakes with this silt. In fact, we have a Coast Guard now who just wrote to me recently, a very moving letter from Fleetwood, mm. who actually saw one of the whelks trying to mount a discarded yogurt carton awful. on the beach. It was pretty dreadful, yeah. Mm. But the idea is we're opening a small clinic for these whelks, where they yeah. get their hair done and watch television, and meet, you know, other whelks with similar problems, and we take them to the Lake District on a coach trip, and this thing, sea shanties, and I feel as I'm doing something worthwhile. Oh, you, you are doing magnificent so. work on this. And so. you are making progress. Uh, not a lot, no. There's a lot of people seem to think it's an asinine idea. I'm glad you told us about that. But there's one other matter I want to raise. Something that Britain really does want to know. Can you play in the conventional mode? How Can you play the piano? How dare you, Plumley? How dare you stalk into my... Humble abode. Yes, I, I knew I, I was... such highfalutin statements like that. Of course I can play the piano. I knew I was walking out on a limb, but it is something sure, that sure. we do want to know, and I do feel this is vitally important. And if you'll be kind enough to elucidate for us. Well, I don't know whether you can without an audience. I'll tell you what I'll, I'll do. I'll play you an amusing little terror diddle to put an end to all the speculation. By whom? Scott Joplin's immortal, the entertainer. Yes. Will that suffice? That will, yes. Thank you. Well, Somebody said to me, why don't you play the piano by here? I said, no, I'll play it over there. Ready, probably? Very well. <laughs> I'm getting. <laughs> 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 